The South Melbourne Football Club is arguably the best football club in Australia. It is officially named the Oceania Club of the Century by FIFA. It's a club steeped with tradition and triumph. And to talk more about the South Melbourne Football Club, we have with us Football Coordinator and Media Manager for South Melbourne, Skip Fulton. Skip, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me along, great to be here. Uh, so what exactly do you do apart from absolutely everything at South Melbourne? <laughs> So my core role is looking after the media and communication side of the club, but in the last couple of years it's expanded to be the football director of our All Abilities program. Um, so wide encompassing around diversity and inclusion uh, and trying to offer football for as many different members of the community as we can. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay so, did anybody else have a question? No. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks for coming, Skip. Yeah. Uh, that was great. <laughs> I thought you wanted to yeah. ask another one. No, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> Before we start a recording about um, how busy you've been lately and some of the commitments and there's some exciting news about what you've been asked to step up and do, I think, for the Power Chair team. Yeah, so we, we ran a, a development camp here in Melbourne. Uh, so we had the Australian national team come down to Melbourne for their training in preparation for the World Cup that's coming up in Sydney in, in November, October, November next year. Uh, and as a result of that, I've been invited to be the team manager uh, for the national team. So it's really a great opportunity, not just for myself, but also for the Victorian environment to be more involved in that national team. Uh, Victoria, for the first time, we've got three players trialling as part of that squad uh, to potentially you know, represent their state and their country at a World Cup level. Uh, so some really great opportunities coming up for us all. So by your own admission, you're a relative newcomer to the World Games, so we're not talking 20, 30 years. How did you progress from, say, the involvement at South Melbourne into the All Abilities, the Power Chair, the Blind Team, because South Melbourne has a presence in those areas. What got you started? So the journey for us as a club started about five years ago. Uh, in mid-2018, uh, we were approached by what was then the Victorian Electric Wheelchair Sporting Association, and they had one team, which was Melbourne City. Uh, they'd grown through some great work of people like Craig Kilby and Luke David, expanded their player base, and they were now ready to have a second team. Um, so they had approached another club that had declined and so they had come to us. Uh, we said yes straight away. Um, so it was about embracing that, that group of individuals into our club. Uh, everything from bringing them along to social events, bringing them onto match days, providing them with playing kit, uh, on, off field apparel, hoodies, jackets, that sort of thing, to really say you are another senior, club, senior team within our club environment. Um, and so that's been five years through that journey. Um, a similar scenario occurred with Australian Blind Football. They wanted to grow their blind and vision impaired football program here in Melbourne. They'd seen what we'd been doing in the power chair space uh, and invited us to partner with them to run that program. And so we're now um, two years into that uh, and looking forward to commencing the next expansion of that uh, as we progress next year. Is there any similar roles in other states to, to yours? So uh, any people that you know that you're building that kind of national um, yeah, acknowledgement and making it more popular? It's really progressive in certain states have certain pockets. New South Wales is very big, especially in the power chair space. They, they formed it, they, got, they really were the ones that kicked it off. So when you look at the dynamics of the Australian football hierarchy, there are some A-League clubs who are very, very active, very, very involved. I'd probably say that Western Sydney Wanderers and Sydney FC are really the benchmark mm -hmm. uh, at that level. Uh, the next level down, NPL clubs like ourselves uh, are also getting involved in that sort of thing. So some of these clubs have dedicated all abilities coordinators, similar to the role I sort of do. So it's a great opportunity to leverage off of what they've done, share the ideas of what we've done, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, one of the biggest uh, discussion points we always have is what we call recru basic recruitment. How do you get the message out there? How do you get into whether it's um, tracking families or getting those new players to come along and try for the very first time is one of the biggest challenges for us. Um, generally, once we find, once we get them there, they generally get hooked pretty quickly and they, and they like to come back. And how can someone trial? Like, if, do they contact you or the club? Who does yeah, do so, contact? Yeah, so the greatest thing is through either the South Melbourne website at smfc.com.au or for PowerChef specifically, it's psv.org.au. Um, and you get appreciation for what the sport's about. So they've got videos, photos, everything. You get an idea and appreciation of, of what we have to offer. Um, power chair is generally a summer month uh, kind of activity. Uh, the players don't really like the cold too much. So um, we generally go from October through until about April. We run every two out of every three Sundays, just in Parkville at Melbourne Sports Centres. Um, and every single one of those sessions has come and try included. So um, people can try it in their everyday power chair 
or we provide them with a loan chair that they could swap into to have a go uh, at one of the more advanced chairs. And similar to our blind football program, that's a winter activity from April through to early October. Um, and again, we run that every two weeks in Elwood Park. And again, most of those have a come and try session to enable inter people who are interested to try it out for the first time to get involved and see if it suits them. And, and in terms of the South Melbourne Football Club as a whole, I mean, some people may not know that South Melbourne is the FIFA approved Oceania Club of the Century. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about the South Melbourne Football Club? Because obviously it's a club full of history and triumph and trophies and, and some amazing players and coaches. So the journey of the club started back in 1959, six, over six decades ago. It was the merger of three clubs within the Elba Park, Middle Park sort of precinct. Uh, and out of that formed South Melbourne Football Club. Um, so it's risen over those six decades through uh, participating in both state level and national level competitions, built its history up uh, and has been very successful both on the pitch and off the pitch. Um, we've got a major, we're a major tenant at Lakeside Stadium, um, so that's our home base. Uh, so we're very privileged to have that opportunity. We've been very successful on the pitch over the years with um, common names that people may come across in Australian football, the most recent one for that is Ange Postecoglou and the success he's had uh, as the Australian national team coach at the Asian Cup, success in Japan, now over in Scotland with Celtic. Uh, and he came through the South Melbourne Junior Program as a player, uh, very much a family environment where he grew up with his family, uh, then as successful as a senior player and then as a coach. Um, so the success really culminated in that recognition in the late 1990s, um, going back to back at the National Soccer League Championship, uh, then travelling as part of winning the Oceania, similar to the Euros. You know, mm. you, you play Champions League, and then we actually competed in the first ever Club World, Ch World, Club World Championship uh, where the team travelled over to South America. Mm. Um, and, and amazing little things of, you know, John Anastasiadis scored at that event. We're the only Australian team to have actually played the likes of Manchester United in a competitive fixture. So a lot of fantastic opportunities that we as a club have been able to participate in over the years. And looking back to the to the last season, I mean, South Melbourne had a very successful season during, um, yeah, finishing first on the ladder. But then you had this. Um, you might not talk <laughs> about it anymore, but you had this devastating loss in the in the grand final against Oakley. Just from your perspective, looking back, would you say it was still a great season, or is there still a little bit of disappointment how it ended? In particular, all the story around where the mm. final and you know first they wanted to uh, go out to Caroline Springs and then they moved it to Heidelberg. Looking back on that, what's your um, memories on that now? Couple of answers. Oh, okay. well, a couple of answers. Couple of answers. I'll focus on the All Abilities program first. Sure. We won the National Blind Football Championship. Tick. And, <laughs> and, and Power, huge congratulations exactly. to that. Power Chair team won the championship. Tick. Tick. Happy. The senior women's team had a transformative year in terms of they had nine. I think it was nine out of our starting eleven have gone on to play overseas W A League women's. So we had a really generational shift in our player base. So they didn't have the best year. Missed out on finals. Um, our under 15 boys won the premiership, our under 21 reserve men's won the premiership in the championship. Senior men, we will come to your question. <laughs> uh, the senior, the senior okay, men, everybody get close, yeah, listen. <laughs> the senior men had, had a, a fantastic year throughout the league, um, going through very successful, I think it was possibly the most successful, one of the most successful years yeah. we've had in terms of the number of wins. Um, when we got to the last, latter stages, we lost a couple of players, yeah. injury, Harrison, Sawyer, Golden Boot, was very successful in getting a contract overseas. Uh, so we supported him to go and do that. Won't necessarily weaken the team, but it took some of our key individuals out of that. Yeah. Um, so you're yeah, going into that into that last match in Oakley. Obviously, if you look at that and say, yes, it clearly wasn't the best game of the year for us, and Lo Oakley played exceptionally well uh, for that. So you look at the scenario like any football game. You go two or three down. You start having to, having to get desperate to chase the game. And so if you drop to a three at the back or similar to the sort of scenario, you can see where some of those last minute goals, you can just, you know, it just runs away from you. Uh, and that's what happened to them. So look, credit, credit to Oakley, that was their first championship in Victoria. Uh, so they had a good day and um, they deserved the result that they got. And in terms of the future, South Melbourne desperately wants to get in the A-League now for, for years. What's the perspective on that at the moment? So my answer to that is that South Melbourne's focus has been to return to the national level. Until recently, the only opportunity that, that has been has been at the A-League. Mm. Um, so similar, we, we went through the A-League expansion process in 2018. Um, we made it to, I think it was the last five bids from, from that process. 
uh, five or six bids and were obviously unsuccessful with MacArthur and Western United coming through. So um, there hasn't necessarily been another opportunity to explore in that. And my personal view is the next opportunity, you probably won't see another Melbourne club, given the population, the dynamic that we've got. They would look to move to whether it's a Tasmania or a second Brisbane Adelaide or Canberra United has been yeah. looking for them inside. So for us, the focus isn't so much on the A-League. The focus is on this, what we call the National Second Division. Okay. So an opportunity there, which Football Australia are uh, very aggressively researching and putting in place the model that that will deliver, hmm. uh, is what our focus is at the moment. And if indications are clear and announcements, looking at a 2024 start for that, uh, that's where our focus is at the moment. So before we uh, let you go, Skip, I uh, just wanted to, like Dion just touched on, on it briefly, but how did you get involved in football? Because you didn't grow up with football. No, you just, no. just recently you started liking football. So I was, I was in a career in Brisbane, living in Brisbane, and, and for me at the time, between home and work, very, very short distance, like two kilometres, was what's Perry Park, home of Brisbane Strikers. So my social outlet or my sporting outlet, walking past there every single day, was to watch them consistently play, train, etc., uh, and see everything that they were about. So learning a little bit about their history was they were in the National Second, um, the National Soccer League, and so they were historically competing about the likes of the South Melbourne or the Melbourne Knights through that whole historical period. So for me, when I learned about that, and eventually when I returned to Melbourne, it was if I want to continue that involvement, I naturally looked at either the Melbourne Knights or South Melbourne as sort of that demographic now. Geographically, where I live, I'm more south-based, south so um, naturally went along to South Melbourne, uh, got involved, interested in volunteering around some of the media work uh, through the likes of um, Paul Mavridis and George Kurumalis, got me involved in that side of club. That was probably about 2014, so about eight years ago, and sort of grown, grown since then. That's amazing. But, uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, coming onto the program. Skip, good luck to you and good luck to everybody at the South Melbourne Football Club, all the players, the coaches, uh, all the volunteers and all the wonderful people there at the South Melbourne Football Club. And you do pretty much everything except for play uh, at South Melbourne. And I know you're a very busy person. Yeah, 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 yeah yes. exactly right. So, yeah, thank you very much, Skip. Thanks very much for having me on board and look forward to having you and the team back at Lakeside in the future to continue your... Great commentary work we and covering for the matches. Yeah, no, we, we are looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Skip. We have to take a quick break, but first, here's Brian Yap with some details for us. You all know that Wincher makes quality footballs, but did you know that Wincher can customize footballs? You can have your team's logo on a football. Imagine how good your footballs are going to look with your team's logo on it. Imagine Ringwood City on this ball. Imagine Moreland Zebras. Imagine Brunswick City, or South Melbourne, or North Sunshine Eagles, or any other club that you can think of on this ball. How cool would it be on the match day having your team's logo on this ball? Remember, buy in bulk and save money. When you think of quality, think of Winshire. Go to www.winshiresports.com.au or email info at winshire.com.au and win with Winshire. Well, as we know, the Socceroos had an amazing World Cup. They finished in the round of 16 where they lost against the mighty Argentina 2-1. Uh, it was probably a, a um, performance and experience that was beyond all of our expectations, especially ours. Uh, it's a shame that it had to finish, but it finished so extremely well. Uh, what did you guys make of it all? I'm extremely proud of Australia and how well they played in that match. And that heart stopper at the end when I thought we were about to equal <laughs> and get extra time. Um, I saw a really different team out on the pitch. I saw confidence. I saw the desire to win. And I think that's great for football in Australia because it, all it does is brings more people to this wonderful world game and increases the, the talent I think we're going to get. Mm -hmm. But I do hope some of them go and play internationally as well. Yes. And I only can uh, yeah, align with that in terms of really great performance unexpected mm. i must say that as well so i didn't think that australia will perform that well and in particular after that first match yeah. against france because uh, then the after the first 30 minutes it was like okay what we expected then a great performance against tunisia and so strong defending 
and then against Denmark, again, the first 20, 30 minutes, I thought, oh, whoa, 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 that doesn't look really good. Yeah. But um, then they made it to the round of last 16. And I think from that perspective, a great World Cup. If you see how many people mm -hmm. were here in Fed Square, also in Melbourne, you know, really excited about. But now the big thing is what's coming next? You know, what are we getting out of that for yeah. football here in the country? We we're talking about that um, offline already, you know, with the Women's World Cup coming up. So will there be the right consequences in a positive way? Or is it just, yeah, I wouldn't say it's the next golden generation with all respect because yeah. I'm still missing those kind of key players. Maybe Greg Goodwin could be one, but um, yeah, I wouldn't take it that far. Um, I mean, I haven't been in the country at that time, but I think mm. those Harry Kewell, Mark Viduka, those yeah. were different personalities. They, they were, and, and they did sort of go through the system at a much different time than the players that are now. But like when we talk about the future of of not just the soccer is, but football in this country. I think we'll, we'll go into that in greater length maybe next week. But um, yeah, uh, with, with the soccer is and their performance, and we did say this last week, we said the game against France, we were extremely critical because it merited it. The, the performance was just not there. We gave credit where it's due. They were magnificent against Tunisia. They were absolutely brilliant against Denmark. Denmark, we can say yes, Denmark will probably one of, if not the most disappointing team at the World Cup because everybody was probably expecting much, much more from them. Semi-finalists from the last Euros, a good solid team and Ericsson and all that and Schmeichel and, and all that behind them. Uh, we can say, yeah, that they, were, they had a disappointing World Cup, but the Socceroos had to win. And they beat a team who are 10th on the FIFA World Rankings. We can debate the FIFA World Rankings and their importance at some other stage. But... It was a tremendous achievement. And the game against Argentina, I think that there were some people being probably quite cynical that thought, well, for sure, this is going to be a repeat of the game against France. But it wasn't. Australia did an extremely good job. They did the nation proud. And I think a lot of people around the world, I know from a lot of the commentary from people in South America, where they're like, hang on a second, this Australian team were much more solid, much more well-structured. They played their own game at certain times. They weren't scared, they weren't overawed that it was all messy and all this sort of stuff. They have tremendous respect for Australia, which is, it's wonderful. And for me, what will be really interesting and a very good indicator is the Melbourne Derby next week in the A-League. So it's Melbourne victory against Melbourne City, mm. the, the Derby in, in the A-League with the longest history. And to see how many people will show up to that yeah. game on a Saturday night, you know, two weeks or three weeks after the um, Socceroos did such great performance. That for me will give me a little bit of a glimpse already where football might go to. If that was just an excitement about the World Cup and now we are back to reality, or is it something that can be built up? So uh, I'm definitely very excited about that and I was very interested what's yeah. happening there. I hope it's a build, I really do. Because yeah. as we said, we're coming off the Men's World Cup and then we have Australia and New Zealand hosting the Women's World Cup and I hope that pocket of interest flows through and it increases participation and standard. Yeah, I, I don't want a repeat of 2006 where there was this fizz of um, exuberance and joy about the Socceroos and then this increase of participation in football and interest in the A-League and then after a certain period of time it was like just stagnated and they just pulled the handbrakes on. The FFA were just sort of, or in the A-League, they got scared of expanding, scared of supporting their own supporters uh, to certain people in the media who have an anti-football agenda. We all know who they are. Um, but uh, it, it's sort of like, okay, you've got this momentum, build on it. And they were afraid to do so. I hope it doesn't happen like that again. And, and I think, Gabriel, the bigger chance, I mean, I wasn't in the country at that time, but I think the bigger chance had been missed out of the Asian Cup win, which mm. was in 2015, you know, yes. when they won in Sydney in a thrill, I was there in a thrilling final extra time against South Korea, you know, mm. and then I felt like since then, you know, it really went, okay, they were on their road to Russia, but then Postecoglou left, there was a huge blow up about what's happening actually there, you know, probably the arguably the best coach that Australia ever had, mm -hmm. you know, and then they had 
a quite poor performance at the Asia Cup then, where they yeah. were um, defending um, champions and uh, went out in the quarterfinal. And if you look at it, Qatar won. And yes. if you see Qatar's performance now at the World Cup, so yeah. that's why, you know, 2006, I'm, I'm, I'm right with you, but also after that Asian Cup, because with all respect, I think it's highly unlikely that Australia will ever win a World Cup. So to win an Asian Cup on home ground, that was historical. Yeah. So hopefully now, with the Women's World Cup coming up, we can grab this chance. Yeah, well, uh, I, I know next week we'll talk about yeah. that in, in, in greater detail and... and we all want, look, we're all critical about the way that Australia plays or the way that they do things or whatever. Yeah, we're critical about it because we're fans of the game. We want the game to get better. We want the game to improve. We want those that are, are participating at the traditional and non-traditional. Don't forget, there are a lot of people who play the non-traditional sort of organisational structures. Our friend Simon from the Community Soccer Hub is one of those. So we want the game to grow, we want the game to get better, we want it to advance. We know that there are a lot of hurdles and a lot of obstacles about making football the, the, the sort of the predominant sport, so to speak, not just in participation rates, but in other elements as well. We know that, we get it, but we, we hope that football can uh, just get bigger and better and expand and, and, and move further. But uh, yeah, but uh, we can solve all the problems of it. <laughs> yeah. so we're available, fine. like we're, yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. It's not just about participation on, on the pitch. My mum has been converted mm -hmm. to the Great World Game thanks to all the recent World Cup. She's been getting up and watching Germany. She's got up to watch Australia, and she's even given me a tip for the winner now. Because Ooh. let's face it, my tips have been tanking. <laughs> show. Right. Uh, her money's on France. Oh, France. She and thinks France is going to beat England and go all the way. Yeah, so what are we thinking about the, 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 <laughs> game, the games now, the, well, the remaining quarterfinals? Quarterfinals, we have Morocco versus Portugal, which is uh, much, much later at 2 a.m., and England versus France at 6 a.m. So uh, our friend from the Spanish group, Miguel, did say he was very concerned about that game, Morocco versus Spain, and rightly so, Morocco, they've been the surprise packet. We all thought it was going to be other countries here and there, we th you know, but it was Morocco, they've done an extremely good job, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if it's Neymar and Ronaldo at the airport, maybe, you but, never know. But I think the big difference is that um, Portugal had a problem with their star. That's, in my opinion, the difference with um, Brazil and Argentina, Messi and Neymar, you know, they are integrated. Um, in particular, Messi is a bit older, but, but, but still is the leader. Whereas with Ronaldo, it was so impressive to see Portugal without him. Yes. yes. You know, you felt like the whole team was like taking a yes. deep breath and then playing so phenomenally, you know, and then suddenly also when, when Ronaldo came on, you actually felt like the team got stuck again a bit, you know, they were 5 nil up already. Very so true. I think it will be a key and I would uh, be very surprised if Ronaldo is in the starting 11. Mm -hmm. So without him in the starting 11, I think Portugal would still be the favorite. Similar to Argentina versus Croatia, the, the semi-final, and, and, and England versus France uh, Ooh, is going to be a, a, very, very, a, classic, a very big one. That's I still see, I still mm -hmm. see France a little bit ahead of, of England, but... Who knows? Yeah. I mean, that, that one could go down to a penalty. Predictions yeah, at this World knows. Cup, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, t tell us, oh, wise one, Dianne, <laughs> who's been so good with predictions. Exactly. I sat here and talked about the, um, the, the injuries in France for the Australia game because I was quite, I was actually on the positive train. Yeah. <laughs> I was Debbie Downer and then back to being very proud of them in the, in the round of 16. Uh, I think Burns made a really good point. The talent, the depth of talent in France is much bigger as a country, and they've got a lot to win back to back. Mm. Maybe like what the third nation to do it. Yes, I think so. Yeah, Italy. Yeah, so yeah, Italy in the 30s and, yes. and Brazil 58-62. Yes. So they are playing for real. They're here to win. Yeah, I, I think they've gone. I, I won't say beyond expectation, but we're all sort of like, oh, the World Cup curse, but they've just obliterated that World Cup curse. But it, it is going to be a fantastic and game. And it's not all about Mbappé. I mean, he, yeah, he, fi he finishes it. I mean, they have him now with finishing, but the whole team. And uh, with all those injuries, I must also pay a lot of respect to Deschamps, still, you know, having to rebuild the team and yes, uh, he's, he's with all great. the changes. So I must say, well, well done. Exactly. Yeah, the, the only weak point for France is probably Hugo Lloris 
because he's the type of goalkeeper. He's a good goalkeeper. Don't get me wrong. He's very good. He can do an amazing save. And then two minutes later, do something really stupid. So, <laughs> you know, like... He, we'll, see we'll, we'll see tomorrow yeah. morning. We'll see tomorrow morning. England versus France tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Morocco versus Portugal, 2 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. You cannot look... I, I can't wait for those games. Semi-final, Argentina versus Croatia. That's on a Wednesday, the 14th of December at 6 a.m. And who knows, Morocco, Portugal, England, France, that second semi-final, that's on Thursday, the 15th of December at 6 a.m. We have to go. Thank you very much, Bern. Thanks, Thank Cameron. you very much, Deanne. Thank you very much to Elsa Mangan from Go Soccer Mums and Skip Fulton from the South Melbourne Football Club. If you want to know more about 3ZZZ, go to www.3zzz.com.au. Uh, enjoy the football. Thank you very much for watching. See you same time, same place next week. Bye for now.